Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. It is so, so neat uh, to be here and just to be at this church, and what a, what a thrill. Um, Wow, I started attending here in 1992. That's, that's when I came, and I was a teenager, and I was very rough around the edges. Uh, I was a keener, um, but uh, uh, people here loved me and encouraged me and built into me and rebuked me, <laughs> which was, there was a lot of that needed, and uh, just helped me develop in my character and my life and certainly ministry uh, and uh, you know, the, the leadership, but also just the people of the church um, just loved uh, uh, this teenage kid and helped him grow up in the Lord and build a relationship with Jesus. I got married here at this church and then raised three kids, each of them dedicated uh, here, and uh, Pastor Dave and Chris dedicated our, our children, and um, then, of course, pastored here in, in various roles for all those years, and um, love, love, love you guys and love what God is doing here. Uh, so cool to see. And, uh, you know, this is a church that doesn't, uh, you know, just spend all its time trying to preserve the past. That's kind of my, you know, my knowledge of this church is mostly from then. But this is a church that's always pressing forward and always saying God's got more things. And I know most of you, I don't even know in, in eight years because God keeps bringing new people in and drawing new people in. And you keep inviting more people and saying, you got to come. You got to be a part of this community. And you need to know the gospel of Jesus, which is really the hope of any human being, right? And you, you have have that heart to share that and impact our world and uh, love it, uh, what you do. And of course, your pastors, your pastoral team is amazing. Uh, I love every one of them and uh, Pastor Sheldon. In fact, the last time I was here, um, uh, I, I was sitting on the front row here and, and I was about to speak and I had to use a washroom. That's a real hard decision for a pastor uh, to know. Do I run to the washroom before I preach or do I just hold it, you know? And, and uh, I, I decided, no, I got to go, you know, I got to go. And so I I ran to the washroom just before they were going to introduce me, and poor Pastor Sheldon, I think I gave him a heart attack. You know, he wasn't sure, like, where'd he go, and, and do I have to preach now? And, you know, poor guy, but I made it back just in time, and I even washed my hands just to, anyway. Uh, so, um, anyway, this Sunday, I, I didn't do that. I was very careful, and we're, we're all good. But, uh, so, Pastor Sheldon, love you guys, and, uh, and of course, Pastor Dave and Clarice, they, they're uh, mentors and best friends, and... Uh, have, have poured into our lives, our marriage, our kids, um, who we are today uh, in Christ is, is so much the way God's used you in our lives, and we're so, so thankful for you. So very cool. And you, you as a church are blessed to have pastors like you have. I'll tell you, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so... And I do want to encourage you, you know, if you've been in this church a long time, stay faithful, stay, you know, go through the ups and downs together and keep plugging in. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the reality is, and maybe you're newer to this church and you're, you're finding your way, then plug in, right? Get serving, get being a part of it. Because the reality is a great church, and this is a great church. In fact, our church in Moose Jaw, we model a lot after this church. We learn from this church. We watch what you guys are doing. And, uh, but what makes a great church isn't a great building. Okay, as great as this building is, it's not great services or programs as great as they are here. It's not even great pastors and great leaders, as great as your pastors and leaders are. What makes a great church is the people, right? That's the church. We are church, you. And so it's you uh, uh, sharing with your friends and inviting your friends. It's you uh, seeking God and growing in your own faith. It's you loving one another and being community, right? Which isn't always easy, working through all the rough patches of the way God calls us to live in community together. It's you. You being all of that and doing all of that that makes a great church. And so thank you for who you are and for what you're doing. Uh, the best uh, uh, for Victory Church here, Royal Oak Victory Church, is yet to come, isn't it? God is still going to do greater things than he's done yet, and uh, I'm so, so excited about it. And uh, your youth pastor, uh, Pastor Dustin there, so cool to see him. I just see, you know, my own journey in his journey, and here you are doing the same thing for him that you did for me so many years ago, and I knew him when he was like, yay high, right? And so many of you are such great friends. So awesome. Well, uh, enough about uh, that. Let me just tell you who I am for those of you who are, are I've pastored for eight years in Moose Jaw. We, we uh, pastor the Victory Church there. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, good times, hard times. It was super hard leaving here and all our friends and connections and family and church and 
Um, but uh, God has been good to us through it all, and our, our church has uh, been a very exciting season for us right now. We see people getting saved pretty well every single Sunday, uh, coming to the Lord, and it's growing, and uh, so cool you're doing baptism today. You know, baptism, sorry for the Saskatchewan analogy, but baptism is like harvest, okay, for a church. That's what it is. You know, farmers, they do everything else, but harvest is awesome, right? That's just like, oh, there it is. There's the fruit of all our labors. That's baptism, and you guys are celebrating that today. It's, a, it's such a cool thing for your whole church, and to see so many people getting baptized. Wow. So that's what we're doing in Moose Jaw, too, and just helping people come to know Jesus and, and baptizing them and then growing people in their faith, and uh, we're, we're, it's a joy to do that. So I'm a pastor, but I really have a higher calling than a pastor. Uh, I'm a dad. Yeah, and I have three kids, and I'll tell you, that is a high calling. Uh, I have an 18-year-old uh, son, a, a 16-year-old daughter, and a 13-year-old son, and uh, what a joy and what a challenge it is uh, to be a dad, and uh, our 18-year-old is actually moving to Calgary right now. He's moved here to go to university, so it's a blessing uh, and, uh, and tough, so if I'm crying, it might not just be, you know, the awesome stuff I'm preaching. It might just be that, right? Um, so that's... Uh, I'm a dad. I have a higher calling even than being a dad, and that is I'm a husband. And yeah, pretty cool, hey? And so I've been married for almost 20 years. In a few days, it'll be 20 years to my lovely wife, Mariana, and that is huge credit to her, right? So let's give her a hand and just, yeah, very cool. So, and then I have one higher calling than that, and that is that I'm a child of God. And my goal in life is to be head over heels in love with Jesus more every day of my life, and that is the highest calling that I have. So, enough about you and me. Let's talk about him. We'll get into our message. I have a deal before I preach that I like to pray, and if you would stand with me, I'd appreciate that. We'll pray together, then we'll dive into God's Word together. So, Father in heaven, <laughs> thank you for the miracle of building your church. You're doing it here. Thank you for the miracle of building individual lives and building into my life and my family. And God, thank you also for that miracle that you do when your word is preached, that by your Holy Spirit, you brood over your word, you move over your word in the hearts of men and women, and Lord, you, you cause transformation to happen there. And God, in these next few minutes, we just ask for the humility and the hunger to receive everything you have for us. I pray there would be a specific word for every person in this room today. And God, that you would literally change people's lives. God, give us that hunger. Give us that humility for every single one of us. Lord, when you spoke your word at the beginning, the world was created. And now here in a fresh way, Speak your word and change us. We ask this with expectation of that miracle to happen in every life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. You guys all know what a counterfeit is? A counterfeit, like counterfeit money or, uh, uh, you know, counterfeit bills. How many of you have ever seen a counterfeit bill? Anybody ever seen a counterfeit bill? Oh, lots of you have seen counterfeit bills. How many of you have ever made a counterfeit bill? Oh, you're not supposed to put up your hand on that one, right? I didn't even invite a police officer to come and check. I didn't think anybody would admit it. But Pastor Dave, I did kind of see your hand going up there. I'm just saying. Uh, but uh, so, wow. I don't know what to say, church. Uh, we should go with this. But no, uh, so uh, there's counterfeit bills. And, and, you know, most of us have probably handled them without even knowing it. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen a counterfeit bill, but I, I probably have. I mean, who knows, right? That's the whole nature of a counterfeit. You don't know it because it's a fay. It, it, it tries to be just like the real thing, the genuine thing, or the original thing. And I've been looking into these counterfeits lately, just studying them, interested in them. I find them quite fascinating. Uh, one of the greatest counterfeit operations that ever happened made the, the counterfeit bills so exactly, 600 million British pounds of them, made them so exact that even after they were caught and even 
even after they brought the, the counterfeits and knew all the things about it, they couldn't get that 600 million pounds out of circulation because it was too exact. It was too similar. They couldn't even tell the difference between them. It's crazy. And it actually happened in World War II. Uh, it was Nazi Germany that made 600 million British pounds. It was part of their war effort. And their goal was to saturate the British economy with its own currency so that it would uh, uh, crumble the economy of Britain. Not only that, it helped uh, Germany pay for its war efforts. And historians look at that, and, and it was a brilliant war effort. It was very successful. They used Jewish, uh, uh, primarily Jewish prisoners, really slaves, to, to do the work, and they did a, a, an excellent job of it. And uh, it almost, historians think, most historians think, that if, if Germany would have had more time, it really would have crumbled. It did hurt, but it really would have crumbled the British economy and paid for uh, the, the crazy war machine that Nazi Germany was. Uh, well, with that in mind, <laughs> turn in your Bibles to the book of First John. Okay, the book of 1 John. Uh, 1 John is written by the Apostle John, or sometimes we call him John the Beloved. And he wrote actually five books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. He wrote all those books. All of them are about, about Jesus, but 1 John is different than the other books in that it is very pastoral. Uh, he writes it with just the heart of a pastor for the people. In fact, uh, several times through 1 John, and John is older by the time he writes this. It's one of the latest books of the New Testament. He's older, by, and, and, and several times through the book, he says, my dear children, my dear children, my dear children. He's writing with great concern and great care and, 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 and a pastor's heart or a father's heart for the people that he's writing to. And his main concern for the church that he's writing to is that they would, over time, that, that the, the genuineness, the authenticity, the, the, the confidence that they have about their faith, over time that it would shift into a kind of counterfeit faith. That's what he's concerned about. He's concerned that as time goes on and decisions are made and drift kind of happens and, 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 and really there's a whole bunch of things kind of vying in that direction. John mentions the world a lot in 1 John. Several times he says, watch out for this world. Man, you live in this world. You're going to be inundated by the messages and the call and the draw and the, 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 the pull of all the things of this world. But be careful because if your heart starts to go towards this world, love for this world will actually displace love for the Father. And in time, what was genuine, what was real, what was a heart of genuine, real faith, what was an authentic walk with God, in time will just become more and more surface, more and more ingenuine, more and more counterfeit. And before before you know it, you'll have a form of Christianity that has no real power. And so John's concerned. He knows not just the world, but sin, right? Sin right within us, that whole pull in our own hearts towards, it has us drawn us and it tempts us to compromise, right? Kind of puts shiny things out in front of us, says, hey, you know, you could compromise here and compromise there. Hey, this isn't really a big deal. That's not really sin. Don't worry about that. And all that pull that comes on our hearts and John knows that there's a temptation that over time, we could compromise a little here and a little there, and what seems like no big deal could eventually lead us right to a counterfeit. And John actually lists one other thing. He says, you know, really, we're living in what he calls the last hour or the last days. And he says, the truth is, you have an enemy of your souls, Satan himself, who's against Christ, or what he calls anti-Christ. And he says, the reality is, is Satan is so after your soul that he will do everything in his power to deceive you and pull you off. And there will come things, your direction, that, that appear to be true, but they're just off a little bit here and off a little bit there. And if, if you're not careful, if you're not clear on what is genuine, you could get pulled away to counterfeit faith by the enemy of your souls. So John's concerned, and he writes this book to, to assure them. In 109 verses in this book, he says, you've got to know this. You've got to be confident about this. You've got to be assured of this. He says it over 30 times in those 109 verses. He wants them to have confidence in having an authentic walk with God. He doesn't want the enemy, the Nazis, whatever you want to call them, to bring a counterfeit faith and to take us out. That's what John wants. Now, John has a number of strategies for that through the book of 1 John, but we're only going to look at the first one, which is, it shows up in the first four verses and the last two verses. It's the sandwich strategy. It's his main strategy that he puts the whole book into, and here's what it is. He says, really, if you want to be protected from counterfeit faith, what you need more than anything else is you need to know what genuine faith really is. That's the deal. And actually, that's how they train people even today to recognize counterfeit bills. They don't give you the 18 characteristics of a counterfeit. 
You know how they train you to recognize a counterfeit bill? They just get you to handle and hang around and smell and touch and, 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 and work with the real thing hundreds and then thousands and then thousands upon thousands of times until you are so connected to the genuine thing, the real thing, until you are so knowledgeable about it that the minute a counterfeit comes into your hand, what happens to you? You just go, what? Something's wrong with this. Something's off about that. I don't even maybe know what it is, but I know it's not the genuine article. So that's what John's going to do for us in these first four verses and the last two verses of 1 John. He's just going to say, you got to know, you got to be abundantly clear what the genuine article is, and that will help you in your war against the counterfeit and in all of these battles that will come your way. So let's, let's get right into it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Here's what John does. He doesn't have a whole bunch of pleasantries to start the book like many letters did. He doesn't say, here's, here's who I am, here's who I'm writing to, all of these things. He doesn't say, I love you guys, this is all so great. He just dives right in and he says, we're proclaiming something. We have a message. We have something to offer you. And you notice what the message is. He doesn't say, we are proclaiming to you a set of principles by which you could live. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, we're proclaiming to you a certain set of ideas that you need to hold to or a certain even set of beliefs or doctrines. He doesn't even say that. He says, really, our message is all about a person. We're proclaiming to you the one, the one who is the word of life. We're, we're, we're talking to you when we proclaim Christianity or when we proclaim the message of Christ, we're, we're talking about a person, a person. Now, is there a set of ideas that goes with it? Yes. Is there a set of doctrines that goes with it? Yes. Is there a, a lifestyle that goes with it? Yes. All of the above. But that's not the message in its essence. That's not the message at its core. The message at its core is a person. Christianity, when you boil it right down to its authentic core, has one thing to proclaim, and his name is Jesus. In fact, even when Jesus taught, all of Jesus' teachings, they were strange. They were different than any other rabbi of his day because Jesus' teachings weren't pointing so much to a lifestyle as they were pointing to himself. That was what he was, his constant refrain. Come to me, follow me, be with me, walk with me. That's what all of Jesus' teachings were pointed to. In fact, one time, uh, Jesus comes to the Pharisees and he says, hey guys, you, you're, you're searching the scriptures because in them you think you're going to find life. And he says, you're right, that life is in them, but you're missing the forest for the trees, he says. The scriptures are pointing to me. And then I love what he says next, and here I am standing right before you, but you won't come to me. Do you see that? What Jesus is saying is he's saying, you, you read the Bible, but don't read the Bible just to get more knowledgeable. Don't read the Bible to get more information. Read the Bible to get to know him because the Bible is pointing you to him. It's about a person and his name is Jesus. That, that's why the disciples, when Jesus died on the cross, when he died, the disciples didn't have a clue what to do at that point. Different, again, than any other rabbi and their disciples of that day. Normally, if, if you were a, a disciple of a rabbi and your rabbi died, which you expected at some point, you would carry on the teachings of the rabbi. But in this case, that didn't make any sense. How could you carry on the teachings of your rabbi when all the teachings of your rabbi kept pointing to the rabbi and the rabbi's dead? They were pointless. They were useless teachings anymore. And the disciples lost all hope. They just went back to their old lives. Back to, they, they had nothing to do. And, and that is why, that is why the whole Christian message hinges on the resurrection. Because if Christ isn't alive, if Christ isn't available, if Christ isn't here and now, we got nothing to talk about. The whole Christian message is about him. If he's dead, right? There's nothing. There's no message. If he's alive, then he's here and now and available, and we point to Jesus. Actually, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, that's exactly what he did in his ministry. When you look at John the Baptist... What did he do? He kept saying, behold the Lamb of God. Look, look, that's my message, look. In fact, he said, my whole ministry, all I'm supposed to do is prepare the way. Prepare the way. Point people to Jesus. I, I'm going to decrease. He's going to increase. That's the message of Christianity. That, that, in fact, Jesus said of John the Baptist, I love this. He said of John the Baptist, he said, 
There is no one in all of history, all the prophets, everybody who's come, there's no one as great as John the Baptist. He's the greatest man who's ever lived. And what did he do? He pointed people to Jesus. And then you know what Jesus said? He said, and the very least person, the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Why? Because all of us now in the kingdom of God can point to Jesus in an even clearer and greater way than John the Baptist. That's what makes us great. Our greatness isn't us. Any greatness that comes our way, it comes our way because we can point to the glorious one, to Christ. That's the gospel. That's the essence of the Christian message. That's the genuine article. That's why Jesus, he would say, it's, it's me. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the gate. I am the true vine. See what Jesus was doing? Come to me, Jesus was saying. That's the goal. That's why Paul, when he ministered, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, remember what he said about his ministry? When I came to be with you, I determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's that's my ministry because Christ is is everything. Here's how Hermann Bavink, a German theologian, says it. Christ is Christianity itself. He stands not outside of it, but in its center. Without his name, person, and work, there is no Christianity left. In a word, Christ does not point the way to salvation. He is the way. And so John says, I'm pointing you to the one who's from the beginning. This Christ we are confronted with, he is the eternal one. And when we are confronted with him, we are confronted with the eternal. Like Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Or the way John put it in the book of the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, so. All faithful ministry, genuine Christianity, points to Jesus. Now let's look at what John says next, verse 2. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him, and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. He was revealed to us. Now genuine Christianity is all about Jesus, not a lifestyle or a set of ideals or beliefs, as important as those are. But it goes beyond just being about Jesus. You see what he says here? He says, he was revealed, or in some of our translations, he was manifest. What John is saying is he's saying, this Jesus whom we believe in, this Jesus whom we talk about, he's manifest. He's, he, the way it says it in, in John 1, he was made flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Why did he dwell among us? Why, why did Jesus come right into our midst and be with us? Because the whole message of Jesus is that God is made knowable in Christ. God is made flesh. God is made manifest. God is revealed. In fact, John here in this passage, these four verses, he says, I saw him. I heard him. I handled him with my own hands. In these four verses, he he progressively gets more intimate as he describes his own encounters with Christ. And nine times in four verses, he emphasizes, this is my own personal experience. You see, Christ isn't just a person to be believed in. He's a person to be known. He's a person to be experienced personally for ourselves. And that's what John wants to get across in these four verses. That genuine Christianity, it's a first-hand thing. That God is up close and in person. That God wants us to know Him in a first-hand kind of way. Uh, how many of you have heard of a guy named Nelson Mandela? Anybody know Nelson Mandela? Yeah. I, I watched a movie about him recently, fascinating individual. Uh, in fact, the movie was so intriguing to me. As I was watching this movie, I thought, man, I want to read a biography of this guy. Man, I, I should see if there's any documentaries on this guy. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff written about Mandela, hey? Eh? And, and, and I thought, man, what if I read everything about him? Such an intriguing individual. I'd know a ton of things about him. And if you came to me and said, hey, you know that guy, Nelson Mandela? I'd be like, yeah, I know that guy. I could tell you a ton of things about that guy. Right? All these things I could listen to. I might know more about him than even people who are close to him, right? Than even his friends or his own family. But how many of you know, when I say I know that guy, I'm not saying it the same way his wife <laughs> would say it. Isn't that right? See, God invites us not just to know about him. He invites us to be his sons and daughters. He invites us to be in a relationship with him. 
And there is a vast difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone, being in a relationship with someone. In fact, one of the, one of the scariest verses to me as a pastor when I think about my own congregation, is this passage of Scripture where Jesus is talking about the end of time and we're standing before the judgment of Christ. And there's these people who come to Jesus and they say, look what we did, Jesus, in your name. And they list all these things. They lived in the name of Christ. They did deeds in the name of Christ. Certainly you would think that's Christianity. And you know what Jesus' answer is back to them? Jesus' answer back to them is, I never knew you, but I never knew you. See, that's what God's after. The the, the deeds in his name, those are important. Those come through the relationship, but they're not the essence of Christianity. They're not the core of Christianity. The essence of what is authentic about Christianity is you and I having a first-hand faith for ourselves. That's why, you know, if you said to me, do do, do you know Nelson Mandela? I'd say, yeah, yeah, I know know that guy. But it would be very different if, if you said, does Nelson Mandela know you? Right? All of a sudden, it changes the equation, and that's what God invites you to. It's a a huge deal, intimacy with the Almighty. And yet it's the core, it's the essence of genuine, authentic faith. That's why John, twice in this passage, he says, we're testifying of this. Testifying means giving a, a, a witness of a personal encounter, a personal experience. you imagine if you get a witness up on the stand, and you say to them, you know, what happened on the night of July 7th? And they say, well, I wasn't there. But I talked to Sally, and she said this and this happened. He'd say, well, get off the stand, right? Get Sally up on the stand, right? And if you put Sally up on the stand, and she says, well, I wasn't there, but I talked to Fred, and this is what he says. Well, get Sally off the stand. Get Fred up on the stand. And we'll just keep working our way back until we find somebody with what? First-hand experience. Authentic Christianity is you for yourself encountering, knowing, tasting of, touching, handling, engaging the living Christ. That's the real thing. He was revealed to us. Notice something else that he says here in verse 3. The one who is life itself was revealed to us. And we have seen him and testified and proclaimed to you the one who is eternal life. What John wants you to know is this one who I've experienced, when I encountered him, I discovered he's life itself. And that's quite a statement. And that's actually repeated quite a few times in Scripture. John 17, 